Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joanne Oxley. I'm Acting Vice Dean of Research Strategy and Resources and Professor of Strate Strategic Management here at Rotman. Uh, thank you all for tuning into our live stream today. Um, before we begin, I want to mention that although this event is taking place virtually, I'd like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, while we're meeting virtually, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to our discussion on Canadian proposals for a central bank digital currency and introducing today's speakers. The event is co-hosted by the Rotman FinHub and the Global Risk Institute in Financial Services and is sponsored by the Crypto and Blockchain Economics Research Forum. To provide a little bit of background before we get started, um, the Bank of Canada engaged three independent project teams to conduct exploratory design work for a digital currency that, like a traditional banknote, would be widely accessible, secure, and denominated in Canadian dollars. There were three proposals released by the Bank of Canada on February 11, 2021, and the bank will use these reports to inform its thinking and advance public conversation on a central bank digital currency design. Today, we have expert researchers who have come together to discuss their design proposals and debate the risks and benefits of each proposal. For the next hour, we'll hear from the following researchers in order of their presentation, followed by a discussion with our moderator, Bruce Choi, who's Managing Director, Research, Global Risk Institute in Financial Services. So I'd like to introduce Katrin Tin, Assistant Professor of, at the DeSotel's Faculty of Management at McGill University. Alfred Lauer, Professor, Associate Professor at Haskane School of Business, the University of Calgary. And Andreas Park, Research Director of Rotman FinHub, Associate Professor at Uni uh, University of Toronto, Mississauga, and Rotman School of Management here at the University of Toronto. We'll be taking live questions from the audience during the event. And if you'd like to submit a question, please visit slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. And enter the event code, hashtag CBDC. In other words, Central Bank Digital Com Currency. So hashtag CBDC. I'll use the link that posted in the YouTube chat. With that, I'll hand things over to Bruce to level set before we head into the presentations. Bruce, thank you for hosting this discussion. Our virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Vice Dean Oxley. So central banks have been around for a very long time. You know, the richest bank in, in Sweden is the world's oldest central bank, celebrated its 350th birthday only a couple of years ago. Central banks have played a pivotal role in nation building, which contrasts that to commercial banks, which seek to maximize profits for shareholders. These institutions aim to maximize the performance of the whole economy. And one of the critical tools which assists them in performing this function is managing the nation's money supply. The technology for digital currency is here now. It's not something in the distant future. Uh, private cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin have been in circulation for well over a decade and financial innovation is relentlessly marching onwards. Central banks don't want to lose control of one of their most important tools in their tool chest. As such, central bankers have taken a keen interest in designing a digital currency that fits within their narrative. Earlier this week, Japan's central bank kicked off experiments on the, on the digital currency. They had the latest of central banks around the world that have moved from research into putting something out into the field for trials. These include nations such as China, Brazil, Sweden, Thailand, and the Ukraine. Similarly, for Canada, it's a case of when we're going to move to it, not when. Not, it is a case of when, not if, when we move to implementation. As Vice Dean Oxley mentioned, as part of that process, the Bank of Canada engaged three independent project teams to conduct exploratory design work for a digital loony. The bank gave minimal direction um, to how they explored these ideas in order to understand innovative thoughts. 
It's called the Model X Design Challenge, and it's with great pleasure that we get to hear from the respective lead researchers, Professor Tin from McGill, Professor Leha from the University of Calgary, and Professor Park from our own University of Toronto. So we'll kick things off with um, Catherine, Catherine Tin from McGill University. So hello, thank you very much for this introduction and uh, this event. So I'm gonna tell a few words about uh, our proposal uh, from McGill. So this proposal is co-authored with Christoph Dubash, who is at uh, electrical uh, computer engineering as well as in the computer science uh, department. And myself, I am in the hotel finance. So, uh, as uh, we just uh, heard, so many central banks are considering issuing cash like central bank uh, digital currencies, and that, of course, includes uh, Bank of Canada. And for their priorities, as they highlighted in their uh, background document, the Bank of Canada's priorities are safety, universal accessibility, privacy, resilience, competition and efficiency, and monetary sovereignty. And from these aspects, we particularly focused on the question of privacy because uh, it is kind of uh, fascinating from the perspective of the potential tension between uh, privacy of uh, people's spending, as well as at the same time enabling compliance with the regulation, most notably with anti-money laundering and uh, uh, terrorist financing uh, regulations. So uh, to uh, give a bit of um, background for this idea in our proposal, we mainly focused on thinking of what sort of digital currency should the uh, central bank uh, issue. Because there are many choices, like the digital currency could be something that is very private, but does not produce uh, digital records on which we can build things, or vice versa. So in this picture, I have uh, two of these uh, kind of opposite examples. One is called token money. So a good example of this is any physical cash. And the good uh, point about token money is uh, that it is good for privacy in a sense that there is no involuntary data collection. So the idea of token money is that the bank note itself is uh, verifiable, but we don't need to trace like who sent it and who received it. Now, account-based money from the, in terms of the privacy, it is uh, uh, opposite because here we are verifying who sends it and to whom. And um, we argue, and we have a model in the paper as well, that this data collection and individual purchases could have uh, adverse effects, starting from uh, 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 in unwanted advertising, for example, but uh, up to uh, the distortions in the credit, uh, for example. Okay. Now, on the other hand, the weakness of token money is that it's harder to ensure compliance and it's kind of defeating the purpose of having a digital currency because we would want to build something on this digital currency, perhaps like smart contracts and things like that. And this is something which account money has uh, advantage over the token money. So one might ask, should the central bank's digital currency resemble more token money or account-based money? And what we argue is that it should resemble both, but in a very particular way. So what we are proposing is a central bank digital currency design with intentional asymmetry, which aims to keep money spent maximally private while there is limited privacy of money received of course, by those who need to know. So let me illustrate how the main uh, system we are proposing works. And we call it privacy hybrid or P hybrid uh, CBDC because of this uh, difference between the privacy of money received and uh, money uh, spent. So in our system, there are two sorts of uh, accounts or like money, if you want, uh, that people have. So to access the system, Bob and uh, Alice. So Alice is a consumer here. Bob has a cafe which sells coffee to Alice. 
And both of them have set up a link ID linked account. So each individual can only have one ID linked account and uh, a business could have a couple related to their business lives, but uh, a finite number. And then Alice has put some funds uh, to her ID linked account, for example, by converting physical cash or making a transfer from her bank account or from financial assets and so on. And now in order to make it private and before spending, Alice is going to turn uh, some of her funds into digital private coins, which are anonymized. And I will hopefully have a few seconds to say how it will be anonymized. So these private coins will then be disassociated with uh, Alice and would be a little bit like a banknote in a sense that uh, when Alice goes and spends it in the Bob's cafe, what we will record is that uh, Bob has received the funds equaling the price of the coffee, but this uh, transfer is no longer associated with Alice, which is unlike the account based uh, money. Furthermore, to uh, not to have the digital currency enabling like criminal activities, for example, we are having also a rule that this is private coins can only be sent to ID linked accounts. And there are no transfers between anonymized uh, private coins allowed in this system. So unless you're using this anonymized private coins to buy something from a, a individual or legitimate business, you have effectively no use for these private coins, but when you're spending it, say uh, private. And what is also important is that uh, these anonymous private coins will protect the Alice's uh, privacy of spending. Of course, we would still see uh, that Alice uh, has transferred some money into uh, private coins. I mean, not everybody, but the people that are managing the system, but nobody, even the system actors, can see how Alice spends uh, her money. Uh, at the same time, these ID linked accounts are uh, something that can be visible to these parties that need to know. So this is first like the institutions needed for the regulation and compliance. And on the other hand, also like let's say fintechs that want to build contracts on this arriving money to these ID linked accounts. So the way that uh, we look at it from the uh, computer science perspectives that these were the main goals for the system architecture. So one is privacy, which I said, nobody should be able to identify the sender of uh, digital money, compliance and uh, transparency and the tools to implement it so is for privacy, proposing the use of zero knowledge proofs for compliance. This is a whole idea of ID linked accounts with uh, transfers between private coins uh, is allowed. And for transparency, we propose to have this system to be blockchain based, but because it is a centrally managed uh, digital currency anyway, then we are proposing to use proof of authority rather than the uh, costlier means. Okay. So in terms of the process, uh, Alice would need to like transfer some of the funds uh, into uh, private coins before she goes uh, purchasing. So there are three steps in the process. There is um, first the uh, process of minting the coin, then disassociating uh, Alice from the coin. So this is a zero knowledge uh, proof. And then it is a spending stage, which then can happen fast. So in a way it is um, similar to going to ATM and withdrawing some money to spend over the time interval. Uh, but of course, it is digital and more convenient. And then in the system, there are several system actors, which uh, are the ones are verifying identity, the ones issuing the, the central bank digital currency, of course, the central bank. So ID linked database keepers and transaction verifiers. The so Bank of Canada could take up all these roles or could delegate some of them. And so then uh, there are these um, uh, natural range of other related service providers around the system, like say so institutions that build uh, uh, features based on this ID linked uh, uh, database, the ID document issuers that don't need to see other things in this uh, system, and of course the providers of digital wallets. So uh, thank you.
או יפן. אוקיי, אני חושב שאני נקסט, אז אני רוצה להציג את האוניברסיטה של קלגרי פרופוזל. So this is joint work with uh, KJ Choi, Ryan Henry, Joel Radon, and uh, Ray Savavi. So um, what is our uh, two, I want to present you with two economic thoughts that we had when we presented this, when we developed this um, proposal. There's a lot of technical uh issues that we resolved as well and um our paper is available on the internet if you uh want to take a closer look at that but the first kind of question we try to address is where does the value come from so this whole developing this infrastructure will cost a lot of money a lot of investment required by the private sector so there has to be a pie uh and where does the value come from that justifies all this cost and this investment so If we want to start looking a little bit about where the value comes from, we can look at the uh, private uh, sector stable coins or at the decentralized finance space that's out there to see where this uh, where these potential sources of economic value are. And we think that the big value improvement, the big value creation of CDBC comes from smart contracts. So this could yield massive economic efficiency gains. So think for example about uh, trading and settlement. Um, we have a lot of uh, tokens being traded over a billion dollars worth of tokens uh, being traded on um, decentralized exchanges every day. And so uh, there is uh, an opportunity to bring that technology to the existing markets to uh, use smart contracts for settlement of securities, of uh, foreign exchange trading, of uh, bond trading, or a lot of possibilities there to make uh, uh, this more efficient. This reduces a lot of operational risks that companies face, uh, misunderstandings of it, where trades went or somebody cannot deliver uh, or what they, uh, the securities they sold and, and problems like that, that could all be uh, improved with the use of smart contracts. It also allows you, us to uh, create a lot of innovative products that uh, don't exist today. So if you think about, for example, a real estate transaction where the Uh, purchase price is held by a lawyer in escrow. And while this doesn't happen very often, it has happened before that the lawyer vanished with the money. So we could lock up that purchase price, uh, purchase amount in a smart contract and transfer the purchase amount to the seller once the land title has been transferred. So uh, we can, uh, there's a lot of uh, potential innovation in this product space that could come and create economic value uh, from using these smart contracts. So the, one of the reasons why smart contracts have not been that widely adopted yet is that there is not uh, no great settlement currency for that. Uh, and central bank digital currency could fill that gap where we could have CDBC uh, playing the role of the settlement currency for these smart contract obligations. The other big economic question we want to address is uh, the incentives to adopt. So we think that it's really important to bring the existing uh, financial intermediaries, the banks, uh, the credit unions, the insurance companies on board to be part of this. So especially the banks are important uh, because eventually uh, the banks um, provide a lot of credit to the economy, the banks provide services to a lot of consumers, and it, we think it's important to have them uh, as part of that ecosystem. So why is that a potential problem? Because CBDC could lead to this intermediation. So when people hold their savings not with the central bank, Uh, instead of bank deposits, we can think about that in the world today as if everybody would hold their, all their savings in cash in a safe. 
then the banks don't have any money and the banks cannot give out loans to the economy and loans are important for businesses to grow the economy. And so uh, this risk of this intimidation could create a situation where the banks should see CBDC as a competition and, and uh, that would, in our point of view, not be a desirable outcome. So the way we try to address this is that we uh, want to create an ecosystem where the same smart contracts run on CBDC as well as on bank deposits. So when the same way a lot of consumers today, when they deposit a $20 bill in their checking account, uh, think that they still have $20, um, which is actually not true because the $20 bill that you hold in your hand is a liability of the Bank of Canada versus the $20 in your checking account is just a promise from the bank to give you $20 if you want to get them. So, but people see this as being seamlessly integrated and we want to create the same thing for a smart contract environment where the smart contracts run on both bank deposits and CBDC. So this can create efficiencies because you can run the same co smart contract on all the banks and the fintechs. And this is important if somebody comes up with a creative smart contract, uh, like a line of credit or a bond or something like that, then you can run that throughout the whole uh, ecosystem. So this in a way also solves the coordination problem. We think that programmable money will be a thing of the future. And instead of every bank trying to develop their own platform uh, as CBDC that runs uh, both on bank deposits and on native CBDC can solve that uh, coordination problem. So um, in similar to what, what Catherine said before, uh, we tried to address this problem of account-based versus token-based uh, with two realms in our proposal. So one is the banking plus realm, which is account-based and follows the KYC rules for anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing. This is run on a distributed ledger system with strong privacy by default. And this is where you have a menu of smart contracts. We can think about that like an app store uh, where the smart contract comes from the bank that you're banking with or from a FinTech or somebody else, but you can run it on that system uh, to do certain things with your money. On the other hand, we have uh, the Cash Plus realm where people can withdraw tokens from their Banking Plus uh, account. And this is totally anonymous. And more importantly, it also allows offline payments, but everybody in Canada and not at every place in Canada you have access to the internet. So uh, you need to allow for a mechanism that uh, can make payments offline. There are some technological challenges to that and uh, some trade-offs to be made in terms of risk and uh, accessibility, but uh, that we highlight in more detail in our paper, but in principle, our Cash Plus Realm tokens would allow you to pay for a tow truck if you're stuck on the road uh, somewhere in the middle of nowhere uh, where there is no internet. So um, at the same time, these Cash Plus tokens you can use to make those payments that you don't want anybody to know about uh, because those are completely anonymous. So to summarize, I think that digital currencies are inevitable. Uh, if, you, if we as Canadians want to uh, realize some of these economic efficiencies and preserve Canada's monetary sovereignty, uh, we need to uh, do something and uh, invest in a central bank digital currency. So we have these two realms, the banking plus and the cash plus realm. Uh, the first one allows the smart contracts uh, that create efficiency and uh, in our design, we hope to offer better privacy um, than uh, there is in the existing financial system. The Cash Plus brings even stronger privacy and uh, solves the accessibility problem. So we think that a CDBC is necessary to bring Canada to this new smart economy where you need a smart financial system uh, with uh, smart contracts to deal with these challenges of the future. Okay, that sums up uh, our proposal. And I want to hand over to Andreas now.
Well, thank you so much, Alfred. And uh, so I'm going to present uh, the proposal that um, we at the U of T, um, Andreas Veneris, Fan Long, uh, Andreas is from engineering, Fan is from computer science, and Poonam Porius from Osgood Law have come up with. Um, so hold on, I just need to go. So first and foremost, uh, you know, digital money is already here, or at least it's on its way. Um, you, you've heard about um, maybe DM, the Facebook uh, coin that is going to come up. The Central Bank of Canada, uh, China is uh, already having a pilot running on its own digital currency. There's stable coins, there's you know, USDT, Tether on the blockchain. Um, and you know, the, even the Federal Reserve has recently announced that they are uh, in advanced stages of at least running some form of prototype with MIT. And the, so it's coming, it's there. Um, this is, of course, different from Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, in the sense of this is, this is a digital representation of fiat currency on a blockchain. Now, um, there are other, obviously, we have already the ability to use electronic money. If you want, you can use your bank account and transfer money with electronic funds transfer and so on. So a CBDC is to be, and, and Alfred actually explains that very nicely, it's actually something else, right? It's programmable money. So it has money with much more features. The, for instance, the real-time rail that we will hopefully see at some point in the next uh, year or two in Canada, uh, having been in the making for probably 10 years already as a modernization initiative is, is, uh, is different, right? It's just money. So the way we propose it, and this is for instance, where we uh, deviate, for instance, from what Alfred says, is we believe that it is important that uh, you have a two-step process to do this. And the first step, uh, you need, we believe that the Bank of Canada should go ahead uh, and establish uh, CBDL or CBDC by itself on a permissioned system, on a, on a centralized system, so that you establish the digital money. And then in the second phase, uh, you would invite the public sector, including the banks, but also other payment processors, maybe the telcos, to also participate in a, in a larger network, which would be a blockchain type network, it's a permission network. Um, which would then be a shared infrastructure, if you want. And if you think of what governments are good at, they're good at building infrastructure, right? And so money, digital money is an infrastructure after all. And uh, so that would then have the digital platform also that, that Alfred explained so nicely of how it would work and how you can enable contracts of any type, loan contracts and so on and so forth on that contract, on that platform. And that would then also allow the necessary innovation in the financial sector that propels Canada's economy ahead. So um, here's basically, we, we talked about this very briefly, the, the contingency plan or the, the background is this, the Bank of Canada in uh, February last year issued a contingency plan where they said we will issue or will consider issuing a CBDC if cash becomes no longer usable, which is really still a very important tool for many Canadians, and uh, or if an alternative digital money starts taking over. Now, um, as I described the uh, Model X challenge, there was a number of uh, criteria. The ones that we felt were important to cover and to think we really think through is the question of onboarding and KYC, uh, you know, the processing, of course, but in particular, how you can make it anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing compliant. Uh, and uh, then, you know, what we wanted to have is we wanted to make sure that, you know, we propose a system that can be connected to the existing FIs but without actually needing them, right? Because as we know from the payments modernization initiative, which as I said, lasts probably 10 years before we see anything, uh, financial institutions have a huge incentive here to drag their feet. Um, and if we do that, we're just gonna fall behind, right? And so for that reason, I think it's important to have a connection to the FIs without actually involving them. Now, features that we also wanted to think about is how can you have privacy protection um, how can you make it such that you need only minimal interaction with customers because the Bank of Canada doesn't want to run a call center and how you then have enabled innovation and competition in the payments market. So let's start with how we think uh, the EUKYC would work very briefly and very fast. I mean, there's little, obviously lots of little important details, but it would start by having an app which you would download from a uh, app store. It's very similar to actually the, uh, the cryptocurrency apps that you have uh, as wallets. It would come with an identifier then you would go take this identifier and you yourself would then register your wallet using existing tools that we have like Service Ontario, provincial service agencies, maybe government service agencies, you know, credit bureaus, and even the systems that are already available from the financial sector. All of these uh, entities have done some form of KYC. What would happen is that in this automated process, uh, your ID that you have would be stored in a particular database, we call a whitelist, so that there's a mapping between a person and identifier but crucially, 
when you want to uh, make a transaction and have a transaction, you actually, the transactions processing entity doesn't actually need to know who you are. All that they need to know is that you're a legitimate user of it. Which is here. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so this is important because the transaction process essentially does a blind with the exception that they know who you are. Having said that, there will be an analysis done on data so that you can be AML compliant. So if there's any shady business, you can you know, investigate this further and potentially unmask the person. Now this transaction processor plays a major role in the way how we uh, think about the system. We call it a narrow bank because for all practical purposes it acts like a narrow bank. Um, and the relation to the FIs would be such that this is basically a new public utility under the uh, oversight of the Bank of Canada, which would process all CBDL transactions in the first phase. It would be linked uh, to the normal payments network so that if you want to use it, you may be just make an electronic fund, uh, electronic fund transfer from your commercial bank account into the account if you want that you have, which would be your wallet at the, uh, at the, pro the, the transactions processor. Now, quickly, how would the CVDL transfer actually work? Uh, you go to a merchant, let's say, the merchant gives you a set of instructions that could be just a QR code that you scan with your phone. You then digitally sign it and send it to the transactions processor. Uh, the transactions processor will check first your signature. It's a digital signature. As we know, this works extremely well in terms of being secure. It would check whether or not the recipient and the sender are both on the whitelist of authorized uh, users. And then, of course, whether or not you have the right balance. Um, if you want, this is actually a major difference to our current system because it's kind of like a push system, which would allow and you know allow us to avoid things like overdraft charges and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of efficiency gains alone from that part of setup. And then if everything checked out, the, the transactions processor would initiate the transactions on its own network. So it's basically an account-based CBDC if you want. Some information about the transaction would be kept so that you can have exposed uh, AML processing. Now, the next question, of course, is so that's basically just transfers, uh, transactions processing. This is not really something that we that we need a CBDC for. This is just uh, something that you can do, and we could have done probably for ten years already. The next step, and that's important, is that you open the system up, and this would be the phase two, where this transaction processor becomes one of many validation nodes. These roads can be run by banks, most likely telcos uh, or other major firms that would be interested in maintaining also the privacy of the system for people. And they would basically maintain a blockchain network so that you actually can fully enable the uh, smart contract feature. So that means the programmable features of the money. For instance, you can be, you know, you can have a small business, can have account keeping, as it here. So you can have account keeping uh, services, or when you are a uh, you can have something like um, internal payment systems or reward systems, like something that works. So all of this can be run on this network. Um, validators can do branding and so on and so forth. Now we spend a fair bit of time thinking also about offline transfers, and I don't want to go through much uh, to this uh, through this. Um, Alfred actually has something similar in mind there, where essentially you create a safe environment, a secure environment within your wallet. It means in your phone. This is hardware protected. Um, you would take money from your normal account that you have, you put it as basically a, as a serial number tokens that would be put into your wallet. And then there's a particular system, you have to think really carefully about the technology behind it that would allow these offline transfers, which would actually not be visible as Alfred pointed out to the uh, central network or to the, to the transactions processors. So there, there are some concerns that you might have about money money laundering. Although of course, you know, you can only, only transfer to registered wallets. And with that, you know, it's essentially at some point you have to bring the money back into the, uh, into the regular system. And in some sense, this, if you want, this goes with Catherine's system where you have a, you know, asymmetric system because at some point when you put the money back into, uh, back into your uh, account, you, you basically have to uh, take these tokens out. Okay, so as a summary, we think we should see uh, a digital currency, not just as money, because that's really boring and it's not really the point, right? Um, but you should see it as a common infrastructure, a common resource, which would be there actually for a variety variety of service providers, um, which could uh, you know has programmable features so that Canadians actually can do some innovation and provide new products and new ideas, and also at the same time have high privacy protection. Um, you have to think really hard about how you want to do the KYC and the AML on this system. It's not trivial, uh, but we firmly believe that you should do this in some form of um, you know, a uh, two-stage process where the Bank of Canada actually takes the lead, right? So that this actually happens and happens quick. And of course, this is not the most popular view among everybody. Um, we have a lot of regulatory um, 
compliance suggestions too of how you can actually make this happen. And anybody who's interested, I recommend that you read our work. And so thank you so much for now. Um, Are we I'm moving? Thinking, I'm, I'm <laughs> Are we moving to the panel discussion? <laughs> yes. Moving to you as the moderator. Daniel, are we up and running? You're good to go. Okay. So I'm going to start off with um, with Katrin first, in particular the the private uh, private coin idea. Is there Anyone else in the world that's using this or, or planning to use this at the moment? So I think that this is like a particular consideration of asymmetry. And I want to emphasize that in our proposal, we want to really make the private coins maximally private. That really means that it's not just a matter that uh, some eavesdropper can't see these transactions, right, and uh, so on. But also, like, not the government, not the tax authorities, not even the institutions that are managing the system should be able to digitally associate, like, Alice and uh, her coins. So this is, like, very important in terms of making it, like, uh, cash-like. Yeah. Okay, so could you elaborate a little bit more on, on say, that, that concept of the proof of authority? Yeah, so uh, so effectively many of these digital currencies like Bitcoin and so on, they are using like proof of work system, which is nice if you want to create something like very decentralized and uncontrollable to a degree, right? But in terms of the time and efforts, it takes, uh, I mean, unnecessary resources and because the central bank would anyway be controlling money supplies and only things that the proof of authority does be done by one institution or a consortium is to validate that the transactions are recorded properly. Now we do argue that the blockchain itself should be based on open source technology and be visible for everybody to, as my author would say, like to uh, trust but verify. So, <laughs> so um, to see that like everybody is playing like according uh, to the rules. But the fact that simply recording that some transactions happened at some point in time, it is easiest and fastest to do done by an institution. Mm, excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm going to switch over to a question for Alfred. Um, you, know, you, you talked a bit about smart contracts there. How, how far do you see smart contracts go in the future? I think this uh, opens up a really great uh, realm of possibilities here, the smart contracts. We see that at the moment in the decentralized finance space, um, in the Ethereum space, there's a lot of smart contracts being developed that do little things. We could see them as kind of little Lego bricks um, that do one particular uh, problem, like swapping one token against another token. But those can be combined with other Lego, Lego bricks uh, who do, for example, lending. And you can build these great uh, smart contract applications using these little Lego bricks, combining them uh, to achieve um, greater things that uh, uh, cover a good use case for people who want to uh, get certain things done in this um, in this crypto space. So I think uh, the smart contracts are really the place where the economic e efficiency gain is located of such a system. And this is what also differentiates it because I saw a few questions in the chat about why is this different than what we have at the moment? And, and I think Andreas pointed it out as well that, uh, and, and Catherine, that, that these smart contracts are programmable money that can do different things. So it's not just I pay you, I could pay you based on certain conditions. Uh, I can put some money safely away uh, in an escrow account uh, that get released under certain conditions. Uh, I can uh, do a lot of use cases and build them as a smart contract where uh, there is no problem of operational risk of settlement failure, uh, where we can don't have to necessarily trust each other. We just have to mm. trust on the, on the smart contract that it will do the right thing in the right circumstances. 
So I see a lot of um, uh, upside potential of that. Do you see any, um, I guess, unintended consequences? So let me let me give an example. You know, could you see for uh, the government of Canada eventually giving social security payments where they they put conditions that you can't spend it at the LCBO? Yeah, I think um, that could be one potential application. Whether this is uh, uh, whether it's good or bad that you spend your social security money in the liquor store uh, or not, uh, is is uh, is a oh, so It could create a, a shadow economy where someone pay sells that uh, off yeah, to right. someone else. <laughs> there, there could be a lot of unintended consequences, and if we want to look for unintended consequences, we just have to go and look at the Ethereum world today. This is somebody recently published an article that Ethereum is a dark forest. Uh, where there's a lot of predators waiting for uh, you to make a mistake. And that is absolutely true. And so we can learn from that experience to make sure that we create uh, a safe environment. And having a trusted uh, benevolent party leading that, like the Bank of Canada leading this, uh, and to some extent controlling that ecosystem, uh, I think offers a lot of reassurance that these uh, potential adverse uh, side effects could be limited. With any comments from either Andreas or Catherine on on the potential adverse side effects? Look, I mean, there's it's clear we don't know how it's going to shake up, right? So this will be a major disruption to uh, the way banks work, the way payment systems work. <clears throat> so. You know, to, to say that this is not, uh, that th this is something which is going to be super smooth and easy, that's obviously that, mm. that you would be out of your mind to think so, right? But let's just think about what else would happen. So if you, let's say, take Facebook or DM, right? It's going to go public. People are going to use it. People may very likely like it. So you move very quickly from, oh, this is convenient to something which becomes central to an economy and to be in, in the working of an economy. So then all of a sudden we have our money. First of all, DM will not have a Canadian coin uh, run on a network, which is done by a private corporation and nothing, there, there, there's no oversight mechanism for it at this point in time. Where is this going to lead us to, right? So there's, yeah. I think there's huge unintended consequences for inaction. Yes. Uh, and at the very least, I think you need to have, you know, so what the Bank of Canada does, of course, it, it plans for the future. But, you know, honestly, if you think about it, given the contingency planning, if, they, if it actually comes to that, that's already too late, right? Because you're trying to establish something when something else is already taken over. That's not, you know, that's not going to work very well. Right? So, uh, so let, me, let me continue on that, Andreas, as in what do you see is the, the biggest technological challenge? What's, what's stopping us from doing it now? So first, I think it's not just technology. Now, so let's, let's say a few things. So... So Alfred alluded to some of the really cool things that we see on the Ethereum network, and, and they are pretty remarkable as they are, and, you know, both in terms of how they work, how quickly they actually get uh, traction. But there's also obviously some snags and some, some difficulties that are out there, right? So these things have not been tested and so on and so forth, but we can learn from this. Um, so setting up, for instance, smart contracts is tricky, right? You need to have an audit process to make sure that, speaking of unintended consequences, that you're not doing something wrong, Anybody who knows anything about crypto knows about the DAO uh, problem that they had in 2015 at Ethereum, right? So now, second thing, is the technology already there? This is a tricky one. Um, if you ask me the DM network when it goes public, is, this is a permissioned network. They have a programming language called Move, which is apparently is a well-researched language. I think it's been developed by an MIT professor, works extremely well. You can learn from that and use it, right? Um, so when it comes to it, you can literally borrow the entire technology and just simply use it out of the box if you want it off the shelf. Um, if you look at the private sector development, IBM recently ditched Hyperledger or support for Hyperledger. So we don't know where R3 is going. Uh, you know, JP Morgan ditched uh, Quorum. I mean, not ditched, but, you know, essentially they did, right? So they moved it out to consensus. So they gave up on that. Not in the sense that it's not good enough, but it's just not their core competency. So th there are a lot of uncertainties of how this would develop. I think when we look at DM, that's probably a very good opportunity for us to move forward. Um, and there's a lot of, I think the next step where anybody would be actually to develop a prototype just to see how, what you can do. But I think the more, the bigger concern is the transition and to get the financial sector on board and to, to work through the uh, resistance that is coming. 
Um, so if you look at what happened in the US, when they made the announcement about CBDC there, it just took those two days for uh, JP Morgan and Goldman to, to ring the alarm bells about how they should not do this now, they should slow down. Okay. So I'm going to go to a couple more questions that we're getting from the audience. Um, Alfred, I'll pass this one to you. So this is a, a direct challenge. Why do we even need a central bank digital currency? Everything's going online and cashless anyway. How would you respond yeah. to that? I think... Um that the way the existing electronic system works uh, still has a lot of inefficiencies. A lot of people look at uh, trying to balance check Excel payments. So if somebody, if one company owes some contractual obligations to another one, they uh, make sure that they compute how much they owe the other company, the other company, does the same computation again, looks at is am I being paid the right amount to make the payment, things could go wrong. So there's a lot of um, work involved in verifying that these contractual obligations are met, that the payments are correct and match these contractual obligations. So all of this could be automated uh, with smart contracts, which cannot be done in the existing system. Uh, The payment system as it is, could potentially be improved, but still uh, is lags behind uh, a lot of the technological possibilities. It still takes if I want to send uh, Andreas some money with the traditional financial system. Uh, it still uh, usually takes a lot of time. If you use an e-transfer, it's fast, but it only goes for so much, so many dollars. If you want to send a large amount, it doesn't work. So there is limitations uh, all over that are totally unnecessary by today's technology. And you could do much better than that and do this faster, more efficient, and save a lot of uh, the back office effort that's involved today in making sure that everything matches everything uh, we could eliminate that overhead by using uh, programmable money. Okay. Um, so another question from the audience, and I'm, I might pass this one over to, to Katrin. Um, oh, hang on, Andreas is waving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I, have, I, wanted, I wanted to add to, to Alfred's Chip comment, in. if I may, because I think this is, this is the most misunderstood issue. Yes, it's easy for you to tap your card uh, and all that. That's fine, right? but the inefficiency in the system are massive. The cost of the system on Canadian consumers is massive. The payment sector uh, has revenues in 2016, the latest data that I saw of $16 billion. That's bigger than the agricultural sector. And that's just for shifting money around. This is not a competitive market. It's not a competitive sector. Uh, If you look at um, the the efficiencies gained in uh, from WeChat Pay, for instance, in China, whatever you want to think about it, it's it's phenomenal what they have accomplished. Uh, they basically, WeChat has, and Alipay both do about 80% of what the retail bank is doing. Retail banks provide commoditized services first and foremost, yet they're big and expensive. So the efficiencies that are just driven just by the inefficiencies of the payment system are there. And the cost paid for the inefficiencies is actually by poor people. So. This payment system as a whole, and if you look at the history of the whole thing, since the, you know, basically since we had the low interest rate environment after the dot-com bubble burst, banks have shifted from making money of interest to making money from fees, right? Most of these come in some form or another from the payment system, and they come usually by exploiting the inefficiencies that are there, and they go at the expense of poor people. We have, this is the most regressive system that exists. So I think if you, if you think about it from that perspective, there's enormous efficiency gain. Another thing for CBDCs is the idea, the, you know, the, the utopia, if you want, would be to actually have a system which includes all securities, where you can have any, trans, uh, you know, you have swaps can be done on the same platform as, as, as uh, stock trades and bond trades. All of this could go on one system. You don't have, you know, this, uh, this uh, fragmented market as a whole, which again, is very inefficient for no particular reason. So, mm. rant over. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Katrin, um... You know, the, the privacy issue is obviously one of those, those key ones that, that will take a little bit of time to, to get, um, get across the line. So, so have you had any discussions with the Bank of China? Do you, what sort of time frame do you see um, Canada working at to be able to get a, a, a digital, digital coin? 
think that this is a better question to ask from Bank of Canada because I'm, I mean, they seem to be thinking about it for a while. And I think that in terms of capabilities, they have many choices, but uh, I prefer not to speculate on, on behalf of them. <laughs> <laughs> any, any views from Alfred or, or um, Andreas on that? What do you think of the time frame? Well, Brazil central bank uh, built a, you know, it's not quite like a CBDC, but it's kind of that direction within nine months, right? Mm. So it's not like something, this is not a 10 year process. Uh, you can do it if you wanted to. Uh, what they do, I don't want to speculate, but I think it would probably be at the very least two years from now, but probably longer than that, right? Because you need lots of testing and all that and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't think they're at the prototype stage yet. Alfred, anything to contribute? Yeah, I cannot really speculate on what the Bank of Canada is doing, but I think this will be coming. And, and I, I want to uh, say that Andreas, the point that Andreas brought up is very important. We want to have, if there's a high risk of inaction, that something yeah. really bad could happen. And so I think it is really important that the Bank of Canada uh, moves on this and, and uh, just for matters of, of uh, sovereignty, monetary sovereignty for the Canadian system. Mm. Now, the audience seems to be doing a lot of hypotheticals in their questions. So the next one's sim in a similar vein. Now, when countries move to central bank digital currencies, well, will cryptocurrencies still exist? Alfred, how about you? <laughs> I think they will. Uh, I mean, uh, people still buy gold as a store of value even though we have canadian dollars and people might still want to buy bitcoins uh even if you have a cdbc because they think they want to put some of their savings into this digital asset and and why not um the important part is that the government if too much of the uh, private sector investment moves to bitcoins and things like that or other stable coins that are being issued there's a real threat. What if one of those systems fails? What if everybody uses Facebook's digital currency and then Facebook goes bankrupt? What happens with everybody's money? Um, and then everybody will cry for the government to do something or how the government could have let this happen. So I think it's much more important that, that we do have a government run alternative where we know everybody knows that there is a government backstop to that, the government guarantees for that, and that is such a huge value that uh, you cannot replicate within the private sector. Catherine, do you have a view whether you know, cryptocurrency will still be in existence if we have a wide adoption of about around the world of central bank digital currencies? So I think that it's like an interesting question and I think we would want to like in a spirit of the discussion also around smart contracts or if you want crypto tokens like to separate like the digital currencies that are only money or fiat money like Bitcoin from things like Ethereum which obviously offers more functionalities which could even which is sort of business that could even shine more when there is a more universal <laughs> programmable money as like uh, uh, Alfred uh, was uh, telling. Now with uh, pure forms of like uh, fiat uh, currencies like Bitcoin, yeah, I mean, of course, there can always be speculative uh, demand, and then there is also the choice about what these uh, systems are offering. So if the central bank's digital currencies are better for privacy, for spending, like this mm -hmm. is. Uh, uh, you know, because like people think that Bitcoin is very private, but it's rather pseudonymous. So it is still, unless people make big efforts to lose a trace, like it is still like traceable what you spend compared to something that uh, can be generated more uh, systematically. Right. So in terms of uh, uh, like yeah, what uh, functionalities these different systems offer, I kind of like determine what people would actually want to use like for transactions and I think there is a lot of appeal of the central bank's digital currency which can be faster don't need to rely on I can see also some questions about the costs of the blockchain based system but uh, one thing to highlight is blockchain is not the same as proof of work which is particularly known to be uh, 
uh, very expensive. So, yeah, I think the things that are very similar, there is natural competition, but I see a lot of things from the crypto tokens world easily being adapted to uh, a world with <laughs> good central bank digital currencies and be even better in system labs. Okay, so I know so we're almost at the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask one last question where you each have less than 50 seconds, uh, less than 60 seconds to respond, and I'll go in the order of um, Alfred Catra than, than, um, than Andreas. So the question is, what do you think the future looks like? Alfred, you first. I think that every country will issue their central bank digital currency. Uh, we will move to a world where more uh, of the trading goes to these smart contract platforms. We'll have an app store where we can buy certain financial products that we can combine with money uh, and use them from our phone. This will broaden the access for small corporations, access to finance. Financial markets will hopefully get more competitive and consumers can benefit from that. I'm an optimist. Catherine, the future, what do you think it will look like? Yeah, I guess that in the spirit of my proposal, I think there is increasing attention to the data privacy issues and more nuanced questions about what do we want to actually protect. And this is obviously like enhanced with uh, better abilities of data analysis and the possibility to send, build better things based on this data, which is many relevant for many fintech uh, developments so this is two things like more attention and thinking about that and second new financial products like you know individuals being able to participate as they are now in a greater set of financial assets and investments and that are contracted so i see things going nicely in an innovative way yeah fantastic andreas anchor is off all right. So um, I agree with Alfred that um, many countries will be issuing uh, a CBDC within the next 10 years. Uh, smaller countries will adopt, uh, you know, the CBDC of larger countries. So they will actually no longer have monetary policy. Um, the financial sector as a whole, in particular, retail banks, commercial banks will shrink dramatically uh, as many of the services that they provide are commoditizable and will move into an automated setting. Maybe they find other things to do. Um, we will see a thriving ecosystem of interactions between existing blockchains of different uh, private initiatives. Uh, all of them will be, you know, put together with uh, with programmable money. Um, and the financial industry in ten years, not so much the investment banking industry or the capital markets, but the but the industry as banks as we know it will have changed fundamentally. Will no, nothing like it is today. That's fantastic. So it was great getting insights from um, Professors Tin, Leah, and Park today. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to Vice Dean Oxley. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. So thank you to Bruce and to all of our researchers for the informative presentations and that lively discussion. Uh, thanks, too, for the audience for tuning in. And I do notice that there are still many interesting questions in the chat that we weren't able to get through but that will be uh, uh, shared with the uh, presenters and perhaps that's a good segue just to say that if you enjoyed today's event as much as i did uh, you may also be interested in our free live stream of the crypto and blockchain economics research conference the cber conference that's taking place on friday and saturday april 16th and 17th so that conference will be co-hosted by FinTech at Cornell and the Rotman FinHub. And it features four sessions over two days with presentations and discussions featuring authors of newly published research papers related to cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. So for full details and to register for that live stream and many others, uh, please visit the Rotman events website. In the meantime, everybody have a great day and uh, enjoy hopefully some sunshine where you are. Thanks. Thank you.